Hey, Upper Room family. I've got some exciting news for you just in time for Christmas. The long anticipated and all original album from the Upper Room worship team is going to be here in just a few weeks. And we're so happy to share what has been in our hearts and we hope that you guys love it. Uh, the Weight of Your Glory is going to be here in CD form and online in the major spots like Apple iTunes and Amazon. Uh, we'll be keeping you updated, but for now, uh, here's a quick little preview of our EP. Merry Christmas season, everybody. I hope you have the holiday spirit going on. Back in the van, I figure there's not a lot more days where I'll get to record in the van because it's gonna get colder. Um, in this Advent season, we are following the traditional church calendar themes of each of the Advent weeks. So we dealt with hope last week, and today we're gonna be talking about peace. So peace is, of course, a central theme in Christmas. We celebrate peace on earth. Jesus came to bring peace. So the verse I'll start with today is the classic Christmas verse, Luke 2, 13 and 14, which says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Jesus came to bring peace. And because he came to bring peace, we who are his followers, we who are his body, the body of Christ, are to embody peace. We are to be ruled by peace. In fact, we are the means by which the peace that he planted in his life, death and resurrection, we are the means, the conduit through which that peace continues to grow in this world. And so Paul tells us this in Colossians chapter 3, he says, above all, Above all, this is the most important thing he's saying, clothe yourselves with love. He says, I want you to put on clothes every day before you go out of the house. Clothes of love. Wrap yourself in love every day because that binds us all together in perfect harmony, he says. All of the fragmentation of this world, all the disunity, all the hostility is a result of people lacking love. But he's not done yet. Then he says, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be Lord of your hearts. For, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. The church is to be a peace-spreading, peace-manifesting body. And so to belong to the body means you are called to embody the peace of Christ. 
And so if we wrap ourselves in love, we will be manifesting that kind of peace because Paul says that that says that love binds everything together in harmony. Everything that's fragmented about us and fragmented about the world is what causes anxiety and conflict and violence. Self-sacrificial love does the opposite of that. But here's the thing. I really think that most people will not, and I know I certainly did not take seriously the call to let the peace of Christ rule in my heart until I got disgusted with the relentless violence and conflict that characterizes human history. The, the you hit them and they, they pledge to avenge through violence on you and they hit you and the cycle of violence that goes on and on and on. Let me show you an example of this in the Bible. Judges chapter 15 says later on during the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat as a present to his wife. So take note, fellas. He said, I'm going into my wife's room to sleep with her, but her father wouldn't let him. I don't know what's going on there. I truly thought you must hate her, her father explained. So I gave her in marriage to your best man. But look, her younger sister is even more beautiful than she is. Marry her instead. So Samson said, this time. So, okay, so this shows that there's some history here, some history of offense. This isn't the first time something has happened. This time, I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do to you Philistines. Then he went out and he caught 300 foxes. He tied their tails together in pairs and he fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then he lit the torches and let the foxes run through the grain fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. He also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. Which, obviously, Samson gets some points for his creativity, but whoa. Right? He burnt up the grain and the sheaves and the uncut grain and the vineyards and the olive groves. This isn't like a little, re- real, little bit of retaliation. This is how the Philistines eat. This is how they trade and barter. Samson basically destroys their whole economy. Who did this? The, Philistine demand, the Philistines demanded. Samson was the reply. Because his father-in-law from Timnah gave Samson's wife to be married to his best friend. So the Philistines went and got the woman and her father and burned them to death. Well, because you did this, Samson vowed. Yeah, because his hands are clean in this deal. I won't rest until I take my revenge on you. So he attacked the Philistines with great fury and killed many of them. Then he went to live in a cave in the Rock of Edom. The Philistines retaliated by setting up camp in Judah and spreading out near the town of Lehi. The men of Judah asked the Philistines, why are you attacking us? The Philistines replied, we've come to capture Samson. We've come to pay him back for what he did to us. So 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the Rock of Edom. They said to Samson, don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? But Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. You notice a pattern here? What starts off as some personal thing with the father-in-law and some bizarre love triangle or quadrangle or something moves to 300 foxes tied together burning whole olive groves and vineyards and grain and then and then murder people being burned to death and in no time it was just a couple of people it's 3,000 men going what are you doing to us and you'll see this kind of pattern over and over in the scriptures and in our culture here's what you see What they each do is they vilify or demonize the other person. Samson says, well, because you did this, as if he's good and his hands are clean and they are evil. And so when people get into this, these, these kinds of patterns of revenge and vengeance, what often happens is they, they divide themselves, right? I am light. I'm all light. That person is darkness. I am good. They are evil. And they make themselves out to be totally pure and unblemished while their enemy or their adversary becomes the exact opposite. Everything gets real black and white. People become incapable of saying, you know what, I'm, I may be partly to blame here. I may have done something to feed the flames of this deal. And you see, this pattern keeps escalating. It starts off with just a couple of people, and pretty soon it's, uh, it's the whole economy, it's murder, it's 3,000 men involved in this thing. It isn't just you did something bad to me, so now I'm going to respond with something equally bad. Violence. Revenge always escalates. 
And we've been singing that song throughout history. And how's that working for us? It is, I think, one of the sure signs that we are a fallen race, that we have a whole history that teaches us a lesson. This does not work. And yet we keep trying it again and again and again. And I've gotten to the point of looking at this and saying, I opt out. I really woke up to the reality, the truth that every hostile, aggressive, violent thought I have in my brain and every hostile word that I speak and every hostile action that I take, it contributes to the kingdom of darkness. And every loving thought, every loving word, every loving action contributes to the kingdom of God. And seeing that, I decided that I need to take seriously the call to let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. What does it mean to have, have peace rule in, in your mind? It means you're going to purge from your mind everything that's not consistent with that peace. That's what it means to have peace rule. So also with our words, so also with our actions. And, and that is when we're in a position to say, okay, now I will let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. And when we take that seriously, that is when we can become peacemakers rather than contributing to patterns of violence that have gone on throughout history. It really is about what's going on in our minds and what's going on in our hearts. Because everything we do with our words and everything we do with our actions starts as a thought. So as long as we've got violence in our thoughts, we're going to have them in our words and we're going to have them in our actions. That's why Jesus said, don't be so proud to the fact that you don't kill anybody. You know, if you say you fool, you have hostility in your words and thoughts towards another and you're in danger of hell. Why? Because your thoughts become your words and your actions. That's why Paul tells us to take every thought captive to Jesus Christ. It starts in our mind. Jesus came to bring peace and we are to embody it in order to spread it. And it starts by us being vigilant and maintaining peace in the center of our own lives and purging everything that's not consistent with that. This is the call of kingdom people. You, you see this with the story of Samson. There's no, there's no time in that story where anybody stops and considers do I think this is really going to work? Will, you know what? Will setting the man and his daughter on fire fix the situation? It's just, well, well, this is how the world works. You did something to me. I escalate the situation. They just follow the same boring pattern of escalating violence. So we have to be vigilant about maintaining our own peace to break that pattern. Now, if we're going to really let Christ... The, the, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, I think that we need to understand the kind of peace that we're talking about. Most people, when they, when they say the word peace, what they mean is absence of conflict, right? When we talk about peace, usually we're trying to find a way to keep people from killing each other. That is our idea of peace. That's, that is how low the bar is, just to stop the killing. And that, that's good to stop killing, but that's not at all what the Bible means when it speaks about the peace of Christ or the peace of, of God. The, the biblical concept of peace goes way beyond that. It's captured by the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom refers to a sense of peace that is associated with wholeness or wellness, a well-being, harmony. It's a state of being where everything's integrated, everything's harmonious, and it's characterized by God. He's the, the supreme example of this because he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in perfect love. He is Shalom. He is a perfect whole. And he has perfect well-being. And then God creates the world as an expression of all of that well-being. That wholeness, that love, that delight, that harmony. He creates the world to express that harmony. And then also to invite others to participate in that harmony. And so in God's original design for creation, his relationship with us was to mirror the relationship he has with himself. And then the way we relate to ourselves would mirror the wellness of God. And then the way that we would relate to other people is to mirror the harmony of God. And then the way that, that humanity cares for the earth and the animal kingdom, that also is to mirror and participate in the wholeness, the wellness, and the harmony that is God. God creates out of beauty for the purpose of spreading that beauty and inviting others in on that beauty. And it's all captured by the concept of shalom. 
And it, it is in that right now. But praise God, someday every square inch of the cosmos will be bound together by the love of God that Paul talked about. That love that binds everything together. Someday that will be fully true. And every single thing will reflect the wholeness of God. And I believe that, that now our, our peak experiences of beauty, however wonderful they are, are just mere little approximations of how everything will look when the kingdom comes in fullness. I don't think we, I don't think we can imagine how beautiful it will be. Every, everything, every single thing reflecting in its own way, the love of God, the harmony of God, the holiness of God, the joy of God, the shalom of God. It's the kingdom of God fully established. Shalom is the goal of everything. Now that was the original intent. It will someday be, but what happens, of course, is the, the fall fragmented that shalom. And so now we don't have a shalom relationship with God, a whole harmonious relationship with God. And so we don't have it with ourselves. And so we don't have it with our brothers and sisters. And so we don't have it with the earth. Now the whole creation is screwed up instead of being bound together in God's love. It's fragmented by our hostility and every act of violence and every violent thought. Every violent word, every violent deed is simply a reflection of our lacking a shalom relationship with God. The linchpin is our relationship with God. And when we don't have that trust relationship with God, what we do is we end up looking at short-term solutions to the long-term problems. It looks like right now it's just, it's just easy to kill your enemy. That'll solve the problem. See, when you kill your enemy, you just recruited his two sons to kill your two sons and the next generation, which then recruits their sons to kill their sons in the next generation. And it goes on and on and on. We play the short game instead of the long game. This is why Jesus is the only real hope. He's the only real, real hope for true peace on earth. He came to restore God's shalom here on earth. He came to restore our shalom relationship with the Father. And when you surrender to Christ, when you stop being Lord of your own life and say, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, something profound happens in the spiritual realm. We, we can't see it, but we're told about it. Scripture tells us that we are transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. In fact, Scripture tells us that we are placed in Jesus Christ. It's some like re, in some real metaphysical ontological sense. When you surrender to Christ, you get a new address and the address is in Christ. You are in Christ. And so you find dozens and dozens and dozens of times scriptures that tell us that we're saved in Christ or blessed in Christ. We're loved in Christ. We're redeemed in Christ, transformed in Christ and on and on and on. Everything that, that is true about Christ is now true about you. And since Christ is the shalom of God, it means that when you surrender to Christ, you are placed in the shalom of God. You are smack dab in the middle of the well-being of God, the holiness of God, the harmony of God, the beauty of God, the peace of God. It is in you and you are in it. And that is your true identity. That means wherever you go, your ultimate environment is in Christ. You're in shalomville, baby. You're surrounded by shalom. It can permeate your being because that's your identity. And so whatever circumstances you find yourself in, however hostile they may be, however frustrating, however anxiety creating they may be, you have the capacity to experience the shalom of God. This is why Paul says it's a peace that passes all understanding. Because in situations where the natural understanding says, it's time to freak out. This is, okay, this is when I have a meltdown. This is when I blow up. In those situations, you are able to have a perfect peace that passes all understanding. It is the inheritance of a child of God. And so our job is to bring every thought and every word and every action into alignment with what the scripture says is true about us in Christ. We are called to be the ones who bring peace. We are to be peacemakers. And one of the distinctive marks of a kingdom person, one who is in Christ and his shalom is not only that you're able to refrain from violence, that's a low bar for peace, but that, you're, but that you're able to love your enemies and bless them. And you find this throughout the New Testament. So I'll just read one verse here. This is Matthew chapter five. Jesus says, 
he says this in kind of contrast to the Old Testament law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He tells us, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That's an interesting phrase, right? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. Catch what he's saying here. This is Jesus. He says, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. Why? So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. What Jesus seems to be saying here is that this is a prerequisite to be considered a child of God. By his criteria, we don't do that. We can't be a child of God. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying that here that we earn our salvation or anything like that. I think what he's saying is that if we are children of the Father, we share his DNA, and the apple shouldn't fall far from the tree. We should have his character within us. You know, we, we, we like to qualify enemies to the point where they become nothing more than like grouchy neighbors. Folks, when Jesus says, love your enemies, he's talking about people who are actively trying to kill him. They weren't grouchy neighbors. Jesus did not get crucified by grouchy neighbors. He got crucified by the nasty kind of enemies, the nationalistic enemies that were, are, are willing to kill to get what they wanted. And those are the kind of enemies that we are called to love without condition and without qualification. And I think the reason people reject that is because it just doesn't make sense. Surely, surely Jesus doesn't mean, oh, surely he does. And it's not commonsensical. But honestly, what do you expect? Jesus is a radical, wildly not commonsensical kind of a savior with a kingdom that's radically, wildly not commonsensical. And when we sign up and when we submit to Jesus, we're signing up to that. So we're going to take communion together as a body. Um, if you'd like to pause the, to pause the video and go and grab some bread or some juice and some water, whatever you have there, uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? As we take communion together, first and foremost, we recognize that the cross is the way to peace with our creator. We've all sinned and fallen short. And through Jesus dying on the cross, we are reconciled to our maker. And so for us Christians, the cross has a very personal, individual dimension to it, of God reconciling every one of us to our maker. But, but the cross shows us something else. Jesus is arrested, he's taken, he's stripped naked, he's beaten, and eventually he's hung on the cross. And through the cross, Jesus is confronting the whole system. He's confronting the whole way the world works. He's really calling out the myth that violence and aggression and crushing people are the way to win. Jesus subverts the common wisdom of the world. And through humbling himself, even unto death, Jesus wins. Jesus doesn't fight back. He dies bloody on the cross, but his hands are clean. See, Jesus would rather die than participate in the violent way of the world. He, right, he could have snapped his fingers and legions of angels would come and crush all of his enemies. And that's what everybody wanted him to do. And that, that would have made sense to do. But that's exactly what Jesus didn't do. And it, to take the Christian faith and make it a nice passive thing that sits over here and has nothing to say to the events of this world is to miss the fact that Jesus is charging right into the middle of one of the most violent times in the world's history, into one of the most violent areas of that time. And he's essentially saying, I could do the Roman Empire thing. I could get an army together. Only my, my soldiers would be sweet. I could play that game. I could call them right now. I could get as many as I needed. Boom, here, we win. Takes a couple seconds, no problem, big party. Jesus is not doing that. He's not doing it that way. Because he's kicking off a new era. A better way that we can participate in. And someday he's going to come back and he's going to establish this kingdom forever. And, and every square inch is going to manifest shalom. The perfect harmony of God. And it'll be beautiful. But in the meantime, he calls us to be the means by which that, that mustard seed grows, a mustard seed of peace. And this is the distinctive mark of a child of God. So a couple questions as we prepare to take these elements together. First, are you involved in anything where you have vilified or demonized an enemy? 
Are you involved in any sort of conflict where you have decided that you are a hundred percent good and this person is a hundred percent bad? Because maybe the word that Jesus would speak today is, have you contributed to the conflict? Have you been involved in any escalating? They may have said that and that hurt, but I'll show them not to mess with me. They won't do that again after they see how I retaliate. Maybe that's been you. Communion is a time to remember what Jesus did for us. And it is also a time to assess your life and see if there's any areas where you need to repent. Just look at any, just look for any areas of your life where the Holy Spirit is pointing anything out and then do business with God there. And so if you need to take a minute before you partake, go ahead and do that. Let's pray. Lord, today we remember that on a very deeply personal, individual basis, you rescued every single one of us who calls you Lord. So we do this, this communion and remembrance of that Lord, whose body was broken and blood was spilled. God, give us the courage to put what your Holy Spirit has spoken to us today into practice. May this Christmas season, peace on earth, not be a fuzzy, nice Hallmark Christmas card phrase about someday. May it be the entire way that we orient our lives. Help us to purge from our mind, from our mouth, and from our actions everything that is not consistent with your perfect peace. Spirit, we pray that you would empower us to live as peacemakers so that we can demonstrate the shalom of the kingdom. Amen. Have a great week, Upper Room.